Lands, Border Protection, Veterans Affairs and Procurement calls this information briefing to order. It is now uh, 11 minutes after 9 on Thursday, March 3rd, 2016. Present with me today is um, uh, Senator Mary uh, Camacho Torres. Um, the purpose of this information briefing is to receive uh, information from the AB Wampad International Airport Authority uh, on three particular areas. One is the status of the capital improvement projects that were funded by the series uh, 2013 bond issuance. Um, secondly, the status of the CIPs that are uh, funded by FAA and other federal sources. And lastly, the status of the land acquisition surrounding the uh, Guam International Airport. Notice of this public hearing was provided to senators, stakeholders, uh, the local media, and published in the Guam Daily Post on February 24th, 2016. Uh, That's a five-day notice. And on February 29th, 2016, uh, meeting the 48-hour notice. Thus, the requirements of the open government law uh, have been met. This public hearing is also being broadcast on local television, uh, so please speak clearly into the microphone as you make your presentation. And I'm sure a lot of the other senators uh, are also watching this presentation from, uh, from their office. And so with that, we're going to go ahead then and start with the uh, briefing. And uh, Mr. Adda, if you can go ahead then, and, um, and, and uh, Mr. Gerber. Uh, you're the acting chair, correct? Yeah. So you can go ahead and, and introduce then the panel that's with you. Afri, good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Torres. My name is Charles H. Adder II, the executive manager of the AB Wampat Guam National Airport Authority. Uh, with me today is our acting chairman, Mr. Martin Gerber. Uh, to my right is Mr. Victor Cruz, who's the chief engineer. Um, to his right is Mr. Freddie Tupaz uh, with one of our consulting firms, Transportation Management Group. And joining us shortly um, this morning would be our Air Terminal Manager, Mr. Gerard Bautista. Sir, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come down and share with not only the legislature, but uh, the people of Guam as well, uh, the accomplishment of the airport, the Guam National Airport Authority. Uh, we do have a presentation this morning, but before we get into the slide deck, uh, I just want to give you a background on the first uh, the video that we're going to be showing you folks today, which uh, provides a, a story of the uh, of Guam's uh, aeronautical uh, industry from its humble beginnings in the Quantita to where we're at today, uh, close to a half a billion dollar organization that's actually breaking into the international stage with regards to being a fierce competitor in the aviation industry, which we're very proud of. I do want to acknowledge, you know, the marketing folks and the dedicated staff over there have at the airport and putting this together.
key central facility provider for Guam, not only Guam, but the region as well. Uh, we commissioned an economic study prepared by Lee Fisher, which is based on data 2014 of direct, indirect, and induced amounts generated by the airport, which uh, outlined a $2.2 billion uh, uh, revenue stream that was a total economic contribution to the government of, or to our island. Uh, that also included the payroll per passenger spend, induced spending throughout our hospitality industry that supports our tourism, which also accounts for 40% of our island's gross domestic product, which amounts to $5.5 billion. The airport provides 8,500 jobs, which not only includes the employees of the Guam National Airport Authority, but all our airline partners, our specialty retail concession, our food and beverage um, uh, uh, vendors, our contractors, our service providers, our ground transportation system, which includes our taxi concessions, our buses and vans as well. Guam not only is the regional hub mentioned earlier for five jurisdictions throughout Micronesia and three within the Commonwealth, the Northern Mary Islands, but also for transit business to Asian uh, uh, destinations that do not have direct service from the continent of the United States as well. Some of our key highlights that we'd like to share with you folks today. Uh, to date, well, to 2015, the airport serviced 3.69 million passengers um, that breaks down to 1.49 in arrivals, 1.48 million in departures, and a transit um, uh, line of industry of uh, 72,000, which we see growing on an annual basis. Uh, one of the things we're extremely excited to share with you folks today, um, earlier this week, our team met with uh, the public auditor, and uh, officially, well, you folks were as far as government's concerned, will be the first official notification. But this afternoon, we'll be providing the report um, from the OPA. Uh, we conducted a year-end audit along with her office and Ernest and & Young, and she highlighted in a report that the airport should be commended for achieving low-risk auditee status as of FY15. Um, in order to obtain this status, uh, one organization needs to go through three consecutive years um, with a no-finding clean audit which we were successfully able to achieve. Uh, we haven't seen or we haven't received this status in over 17 years um, at the airport, so we're extremely proud of the, uh, the work that we've done at the airport and the folks that make it happen. I do want to acknowledge uh, that during this process, during the opening meeting of the audit, uh, we were notified by the OPA that they would be doing a 100% um, audit of all our ledgers uh, before it be random or, or sampling. So. Um, I would like to note that, you know, to the committee, again, it was 100% audit of our entire, of all our ledgers. So that's something we're extremely proud of as well. Uh, this past November, uh, Moody's Investor Services um, affirmed our rating of BA2 with stable outlook, which we're pleased of. Our passenger activity is on the cusp of 1.7 million passengers annually. Uh, we see this increase attributed to the upgraded capacity and added sections by United Airlines and its direct service to Shanghai. Uh, Avi Air's added sections on its Taiwan services and charter services during peak travel periods in the Asian market to include additional uh, flights from Korea. Uh, to date, we have all of the low-cost carriers that operate out of Korea, so um, we're, we're very happy to welcome, to them, welcome them to the airport family. The total revenues increased to 90 Point three million, which is up 5.6% from 85.5 million in FY 2014. Our total expenses increased by 4.3% in FY 15 to 72.2 million, which is up 74 million in FY 14. Uh, this is attributed to the increase in not just the operational expenses, that, uh, but also encompasses our personnel costs, our contractual services, retirement contributions, uh, depreciation and amortization. Uh, our net assets are up 1.74%. Uh, the authority ended FY15 with a 1.7% increase in net assets, which is up over 619 million from 609 in FY14. And our net position increased by 13.1 million, um, resulting in the net position year end at over 313 million. And lastly, with regards to our finances, our debt service uh, coverage ratio 
is at 1.57, which is well over the required uh, 1.25 from our 2013 general revenue bond. So I know those folks are extremely happy with the performance that we have there at the airport. We're conducting at the airport. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, can you take a step back? I think I missed that last bullet. Uh, with regards to our airlines, we currently service 13 international airlines, which is up six uh, prior to the administration taking office. Also, our, and we expect two more, uh, one hopefully this year. Our air, uh, our cargo freighters, uh, we initially had two. We increased that to two as well. Uh, we did see, uh, we have two regional carriers. Uh, we increased that to one. We saw the unfortunate departure of one uh, a year and a half ago, which was Freedom Air. Uh, but again, we were able to acquire another carrier to come in and take over those routes. Next slide. This slide is kind of busy, but it actually showcases several things. One, that you know we're ranked ninth in overseas arrivals for U.S. ports of entries, um, as indicated by the National Travel and Tourism Office um, and the United States Department of Commerce. We're currently ahead of Florida and right behind uh, Atlanta Hartsfield. Uh, quite interesting enough, um, early in the year, we sometimes track at six and teeter at seven and eight. Um, but we, we end up at nine, and this is probably going on for over a decade. Uh, we're extremely proud of that. And as you can see by the numbers, it's uh, uh, numbers data from 2010 up until 2015 that outlines the passenger uh, arrivals, uh, departures, the transit, the cargo, and our gross takeoff weight as well. We're able to do that, increase, like I mentioned earlier, increase our capacities and break into the international stage or the global stage of, of aviation through our facilities. Again, um, the video depicted our humble beginnings to from a Quonset hut to a half a billion organization uh, uh, that we are today. Uh, we've seen over $900 million worth of investments at the airport with a couple more hundred you know, uh, in the queue with regards to our bond projects and capital improvement projects. Um, our, our total square footage over the terminal alone, not including properties that we own in the south, the south uh, ramp and uh, properties throughout Tizen, is 767,000 square feet. Uh, we look to increase that shortly by additional 40% uh, with the construction of the third floor quarter, which will resolve that TSA combling issue that we've been dealing with post 9-11. Um, that would increase our, our operational capabilities and provide additional re uh, revenues into the airport as concessions on the east and west side of the concourse have been vacated you know since uh, we started that operation of segregating the passengers um, so again we look forward to that that project and the increase uh, capacities that we'll see at the airport currently there are 21 positions at the airport four of them are identified as spots for aircraft parking around our in and around our main terminal uh, we have 17 um, uh, contact gates with passenger loading bridges that are utilized. Uh, earlier this week, we just replaced one of them um, at a total cost of uh, close to a million dollars. It was not, um, actually closer to 900000 um, And That was over at gate 21. So we're looking to uh, have a ground or ribbon cutting shortly. We'll kind of, uh, gladly extend the uh, invitation to your offices um, to acknowledge that accomplishment. Uh, with regards to our land inventory, there's 1,600 acres within our land inventory, uh, which consists of our industrial park, our teens and business park, our south ramp areas, and over 500 acres remaining to that are that remain uh, for development. Uh, the last two fiscal years, we have shown that we've increased our non-aeronautical revenues, um, which is a good thing for everybody. Um, uh, we've been able to lower the employment costs for the airlines. Uh, the more that we're able to increase our non-aeronautical revenues, uh, more capacities we have so to do that. Uh, we look to do the same uh, with our, our land inventory, not just for aeronautical, but non-aeronautical revenue as well. Uh, so we're very excited about that, and we appreciate your office working with us and some of the challenges we have with existing laws and, and having a, um, a better understanding of it so we can move that forward. Um, with regards to our dual runways, um, Last year, we were excited to do the ribbon cutting for the expanded runway, um, which is our primary runway of uh, 12,000 linear feet. That's six left, 24 right. And our secondary runway was also expanded to 10,000 linear feet, which is six right, 24 left. 
Um, although it's unfortunate, you know, with the merger of United and Continental, um, that we didn't immediately see the long haul flights. Um, we want to take a page out of the successful roadshow investment, um, that our investment in roadshow that we did in 2013. And uh, as discussed with your with your office, hopefully in the near future, take some strategies out to some U.S. carriers to try and entice them to operate uh, into Guam uh, for direct flights into um, the island. So we'll keep you posted on, on developments with that strategic plan, sir. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to get into our capital improvement and the $900 million investments that we talked about earlier. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Fred Tupas to get into the weeds with this particular slide, set of slides. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Executive Manager. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Torres. Um, as you can see from the slide, um, would it be okay if I stand up? Be a little bit easier for me to see this. Uh, okay. Yeah, let me just stand up here. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, uh, so basically what we have here is a footprint of our airport. And what you see existing in the upper, in the sort of to the middle of the grayish area, that was the original air, airport footprint of 240 acres. Back in 1995, we had acquired um, over 1,400 acres from, uh, from uh, the, okay, so thanks. All right, so this area here was our original footprint. So back in 1995, we acquired all of this area in yellow, as well as this uh, amber green area down, down here uh, from the Department of the Navy uh, through the BRAC in um, the BRAC, or the base reuse uh, enclosure uh, realignment. That was the first time that uh, GIA operated a an, uh, commercial airport back in April uh, 1995. Uh, we received 1,400 uh, acres of land uh, through uh, BRAC 95, uh, and through that we also acquired $53 million in assets. A majority of those assets were about 40 years old or, or older, uh, and so one of the things that we started to do is we started to move through our CIP program uh, 20 years later in line with that master plan that we had developed back in 1995. As you can see here, the main terminal areas, there's quite a bit of projects that I'll be talking about in a minute. This area here is known as our North Teeson uh, Industrial Park area. This area here is our South Teeson Park. Over here is our Northern Industrial Park area. And this whole area here in yellow is our runway protection zones, our runway, our AO, and our airport operations area. Under the bond projects that we've completed, we've completed the flight informa information display systems. Uh, we used, uh, we changed over to multi-media, uh, multi-purpose units uh, that would allow us for more uh, efficiencies in terms of getting information out to uh, the traveling pub uh, public uh, at a cost of about $3.6 million. Our common use check-in facilities, um, this area here, these are mainly used for our low-cost carriers and our charter operators as they come into the island. The fuel system improvements, we've increased our capacity in terms of uh, maintaining fuel, jet fuel for the airlines by about 33%. We finally got it online. Uh, uh, more importantly, we improved the fire suppression system uh, to make sure that um, our fuel system is safe uh, in terms of uh, getting the fuel from the tank farm into the plane through, the, through our pipeline system. Uh, back in uh, October of 2015, we opened up the inter-island passenger facility uh, for light aircraft, about 12,500 uh, pounds or less. Basically what it is, is uh, we treat this facility as a domestic facility where we uh, minimize any type of uh, federal inspection services, uh, such as immigrations. Uh, they do have to go through some customs, but it's very minor in terms of the things that uh, they do here. Uh, Star Marianas, as well as, um, uh, as, well as Arctic Air are the main uh, carriers that operate in this facility. Uh, other bond projects that we have in progress, uh, we have the whole baggage screening uh, relocation. And so basically what this does is it takes those screening pods and it moves them uh, back behind the ticket counters, back into the baggage handling areas uh, so that it'll uh, give us back the, the space in our departure lobby. Uh, if you've been up there lately, you've seen that it's been really uh, crowded during peak periods, especially uh, during Golden Week and all the uh, several um, celebrations we have. Uh, with our Asian uh, travelers. 
our integrated passenger loading bridge uh, replacement program and refurbishment. Uh, we just installed gate 21, so that, that uh, is, is coming online uh, over the next week or so. Uh, we just finished the installation as of Monday. Uh, they're just testing everything out to make sure that it's serviceable and it's ready to go. Uh, and then we're going to continue on with the refurbishment and replacement of uh, the other um, 16 bridges. This parking expansion, you can't really see this picture, but this is actually a two-story uh, facility. In the bottom area here is where the commercial buses uh, will, be, um, will be located, and on top will be an actual parking deck uh, for, our, for our departing passengers or people that are coming to the airport. Uh, it was necessary for us to, to build this in order to uh, recapture uh, the lost capacity as we expand Route 10A here. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of um, increasing the access lanes and the thoroughfares uh, to support the Tijan Parkway as well as to alleviate some of the congestions on Route 1 as well as Route 16. Uh, here we have our, our, our facility replacement. This building will actually be demolished completely. This is over 50 years old uh, and so it'll actually be relocated if you can imagine it'll be over to the right here where there was an existing hangar. That hangar has several environmental concerns and areas of interest. And so rather than trying to uh, mitigate it, uh, we're going to demolish it and then build a, uh, a regulatory compliant uh, R facility that uh, meets FA standards as well as all of our EPA and all of the alphabet soups that uh, regulate our airport. The cargo apron relocation, uh, this is one of our bond projects. This is partially funded by the federal government. Uh, we will actually be constructing um, aprons in front of the integrated cargo facility. This is actually the old cargo building. And so the integrated cargo facility is about another uh, 500 yards to, um, to the west of this building. And so there's no aprons in this here, a whole area here is considered aprons where the aircraft park. There's no aprons located in that uh, facility at this point in time. Uh, and the, uh, the fuel lines that come from the fuel farm actually stop somewhere around in this area here, and it caps off here. And so we would, in addition to the cargo aprons, we would also be uh, uh, extending our fuel lines that will actually serve as the cargo operations uh, in front of our integrated air cargo facility. Um, our access control and security improvements, we're moving to biometric um, uh, technology. Uh, we're, doing the, we're doing the assessment at, at this point in time right now. Uh, we're, we're making sure that the current um, security access control systems uh, can integrate the biometrics into uh, their operations. The upgrade to our airport IT and, and uh, financial management systems, uh, we're already re relocating our fiber optic backbone that was located uh, as part of the, um, the cargo facility here. So there's actually um, fiber optic that's actually hanging in the air right now that goes from the main terminal all the way over to the old terminal uh, where Continental Micron or where United Airlines operates. And so we're relocating that whole backbone uh, and putting it underground and ensuring that it's safe from the elements and things of that nature. Our financial management system, uh, these, are, um, these are ongoing uh, systems that help us uh, to ensure we maintain our clean audits year over year uh, and continue to be a low risk oddity. Uh, the, la the Route 10 a landscape component, there's actually two phases to this. One is to ensure that the access corridors to the airport are um, intuitively uh, interactive for our traveling public so that as they come up into the airport areas, they, uh, they understand uh, all the signage and roadway systems to get them to the airport so that they can check out when they need to do, uh, when they need to do so. Um, the 10A uh, landscape component is also gonna be part of the Teeson Parkway. Uh, and so we're also gonna be landscaping that area as well. Uh, so that the corridors that all lead from Route 1, Route 8, and Route 16 all converge into the airport terminal area. That includes the marquee uh, that we're looking for, ma'am, uh, uh, to identify the airport. So. The bond projects that are pending, uh, the next series of projects are all tied into uh, the International Rivals Corridor. This is a third floor concourse uh, that has been an issue for us since 2004. It's currently under procurement at this point in time, uh, so we're not, we're not really at liberty to divulge any additional information. Um, but what we can tell you is that as soon as this is done, uh, we, would, we would not only have a functional, 
but an aesthetically pleasing corridor that will lead uh, directly down into the immigration hall. Once this is done, uh, we have plans to increase our security checkpoint areas where TSA is located uh, to ensure that um, we have adequate capacity to be able to process our, our uh, departing passengers. Um, the terminal seating is also part and parcel to uh, this particular bid because depending on what these bids come in at, uh, we'll determine if we can proceed with replacing uh, the terminal seating as well as the flooring at the airport. Our airport, believe it or not, is actually about 18 years old. And so it's about time that we started to do some of the upgrades. And so we're gonna be uh, showing you a couple of them, like our, our restroom projects and things of that nature. Um, we'd like to enclose our arrivals tunnel. As you can see, uh, during peak periods, that arrivals lobby area is jam-packed. And so by enclosing the tunnels, we'll increase our capacity in that particular area and allow for additional uh, lease opportunities to generate additional revenue that's non-aviation uh, related. Uh, the old uh, air elevators, escalators, and walkways will be uh, replaced with more energy efficient uh, type of equipment. Uh, and, and then our, our curbside canopies. If you notice, as you pull up in this area here, as you're getting ready to depart, uh, the elements can hit you if it's raining. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're not only expanding, we're not uh, only strengthening it, but we're gonna expand it so it gives you a little bit more overhead cover uh, and allows you to uh, get into the facility a lot easier than, uh, than uh, how you're currently getting into it. Um, and then our OCIP insurance costs, this is just, uh, uh, it's a wrap up um, uh, insurance program uh, that we would use for large uh, scale, oper uh, large scale construction projects uh, so that we're able to minimize the cost in terms of uh, the premiums that, um, that are built into the bids uh, up at the terminal in terms of the, uh, the projects that we have underway. Uh, it's a, it could be a significant savings, especially when you're considering that we have about $167 uh, million dollars in, um, in projects. Me. Some of our federally funded projects include the noise mitigation program. Uh, what's happened now is we have about two million or about about two million dollars uh, in the program uh, right now. Uh, we just completed our noise exposure maps and so we've updated that. Uh, there's been a change to the FAA standards in terms of how they test to see if a house meets the uh, sound solution uh, resolution um, parameters. And so uh, additional construction has been put on hold until we can progress with all those, uh, those tests. So the RFPs, once we get it back from um, the FAA will be uh, out to bid so that we can go back to test. Uh, currently, however, we have about $12 million in funding uh, and we've covered over 200 houses at a cost of about $56,000 per unit in terms of the upgrades to those homes. Uh, the Wildlife Management Assessment Program, uh, this is to allow us to mitigate any of the wildlife in the area, including the birds that are, are congregating there. We have feral dogs and some other uh, wildlife that are uh, beginning to come in this area. And so uh, this assessment will take place over the next year or so uh, to allow us to inventory all the different wildlife uh, that are up at the, at the terminal and allow us to mitigate that uh, to minimize any damages uh, to, or to our um, airline partners in terms of bird strikes and, uh, and other activities. Uh, the apron rehabilitation, again, our facility has been, uh, is 18 years old, but we do have uh, some aprons uh, that have uh, uh, signs of wear and tear. And so one of the things that we're doing now is uh, taking an assessment uh, so that we can go in and repair those, uh, those, facility, uh, those uh, particular aprons. Again, an apron is a parking space where an aircraft parks. And so all that, uh, when you have a big heavy 747, that steps on their brakes, uh, that you know, uh, impacts the paving, pavement in that particular area. The safety management system that we have is an evolutionary program that is meant to assist management in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, setting policy, uh, risk management, as well as grant assurances. And they would like to have it as an integrated function of, uh, of uh, daily operations for an airport. Uh, this is a new program that's funded 100% by the FAA uh, and basically they're giving us the seed money to begin our SMS program uh, throughout the, um, for, for something that's been practiced throughout the industry. 
Uh, the miscellaneous airport improvements are basically uh, repro reprogramming of some of the grant funding that we've had through the years. So rather than giving back everything, uh, we've reprogrammed it so that we can use that money to uh, continue um, improving the airport, such as uh, putting up the perimeter fencing for safety and security issues, uh, demolishing some old uh, facilities that uh, pose a threat, uh, not only environmentally, but also in terms of safety and security, uh, given uh, the current states that, uh, state of affairs that we have today. Uh, and so, and any other type of airport improvements that may fall under the ACIP program with the FAA. Our runway six left, 24 right, we've, uh, as the EM had mentioned, we had completed the extension. Uh, we opened it up in uh, November and we, uh, and we wouldn't have been able to have done that without the Teton Parkway phase one in place. So uh, we got that done. All the rehab work has been completed. We're, we're closing everything out and we're waiting for the commissioning of the ILS that's underway. Uh, the FAA just brought out their flight checks team. Uh, they installed the baffles in February. And so uh, we're just waiting for the report to get back to uh, the Region 9, um, Region 9 uh, division for them to approve everything and then commission our uh, ILS to get it fully functioning. Once that's functioning, that means that we will have two ILS systems, which means that our airport is even safer than most airports. At, at, at many other airports, especially in this region, they're lucky if they have one ILS system. We have two. And so that ensures that if one is down, the other, um, the other uh, runway is operational with the instrument landing system. Instrument landing system. Yeah. So basically, if you ever pass by uh, Tijin and you look, you'll see like a set of lights uh, with the uh, orange and white building. So what happens is as the plane descends, uh, the lights click on and it just tells you that you're gliding down uh, uh, with that instrument landing to take you down onto the runway. So a lot of pilots use it. In the past, we used to use what we called uh, visual flight rules uh, for runway six right. But since we installed that new ILS in there, uh, they don't need visual flight rules anymore. They just can use uh, instrument landing systems to assist them in their descent. Other federal uh, funding programs, our airport master plan was actually completed in 2012, uh, but there was a geographical information component that had not been approved yet by the FAA. We've since uh, completed that uh, survey, uh, and we're just waiting for the FAA to give us a final approval in order for us uh, to, to close out that particular project. Uh, last year, we acquired one 3,000-gallon uh, ARF vehicle, the Aircraft Rescue and Firefighting Vehicles, uh, that allow us to replace, uh, begin replacing the old fleet that we've had uh, for the past 10 years. Um, we're going out to bid again for another 3,000 gallon ve vehicle, as well as a rapid intervention vehicle. Uh, that um, The RIV is a vehicle that's uh, used uh, when the big tankers aren't, aren't necessary to go and respond to an incident on the airfield. Uh, and the other federally funded projects that we actually went over was the third for arrives co corridor, the hold baggage screening, our passenger loading bridges, the R facility replacement, and the cargo apron rehab. Uh, all of these are partially funded either by the FAA or by TSA. Other CIP projects that we have are our, fire, uh, our facilities and fire alarm systems, as well as our uh, suppression system replacement. Um, again, our footprint has increased, especially in terms of our tenants, and so we're doing an assessment to ensure that our systems are up to speed and in compliance with all of the building codes and fire codes that we have on Guam. Uh, we've just upgraded, uh, or we're in the process of upgrading all of our restrooms, uh, particularly one, the ones on the public side. Uh, we hope to have that project complete by April uh, in time for FESPAC, and so all of the uh, arriving passengers as well as the departing passengers will actually see the difference in terms of the uh, restroom facilities that we have. If you, if, you've, uh, if you get a chance to get up there, um, on the departure level, we've already completed one of the uh, bathrooms there. Uh, further down towards the escalators, if you guys can uh, take a look and uh, see, um, the, it's actually a really nice design. It's, uh, ver it's very uh, environmentally sustainable. We've actually replaced some of the old pipes that were in there uh, to minimize any uh, any of uh, the uh, maintenance issues that we've had dealing with that particular uh, with those particular pipes and things like that within the facility. 
Uh, sustainable airport management, uh, basically what's happening here is everything that we're doing at the airport, any new type of projects or, uh, or any type of activities that we undertake, uh, we always try to implement sustainable uh, initiatives, not only for efficiency, uh, but as well as for environmental sustainability. Uh, and so uh, our buildings, things of that nature, we try to use natural lighting. Um, we try to minimize uh, or maximize the airflows uh, by taking advantage of some of the technology that's out there. Uh, we've changed a lot of our lighting in throughout the facility that's resulted in a little bit of a cost savings, not as much as we anticipated, but, uh, but it, it was enough for us to uh, notice the difference in terms of uh, the infrastructure that we had installed. The maintenance equipment, uh, we have some old runway sweepers uh, and we have some old bucket trucks uh, to ensure that the lights and things that we have uh, around the airport proper are, are properly maintained. Um, our airport facilities upgrades, uh, we are constantly looking in the terminal areas to assess any areas that may be of concern either to our own management or to our own tenants. And so as soon as, uh, aside from somebody alerting us about something wrong at the airport, uh, we do our own self-assessments self to identify some areas that may be potentially uh, damaging or hazardous to any of our tenants or anyone uh, coming through the airport. Uh, the vehicular refleeting program, uh, this is just uh, to replace some of our, uh, our, our airport police, our airport operations and our airport engineering uh, vehicles uh, to ensure that we have uh, more fuel efficient uh, and safe uh, vehicles to be able to um, have our employees use. The painting and exterior surface improvements were about 99% done. If you come up to the terminal at, on the departure side, you'll see that the last planner has actually been converted into a baggage holding area or a, a baggage cart holding area. Uh, and so it made sense uh, to do that. And so we're about, we're in the last stage of that uh, project. Uh, the uh, roofing system, uh, that project has been placed on hold even though we have, uh, um, even though we have uh, contracted it's ready to go uh, one of the things that we asked them to put it on hold for is because we're waiting for the third floor uh, concourse to be done so that we can have the two uh, contractors uh, coordinate their efforts so that it's not duplicated uh, in win any way shape or form upgrades to the vq1 hangar uh, this vq1 hangar is actually used by united airlines uh, this has been a, a, a hangar uh, that's been used by united since we took over uh, it's been, uh, there's some areas that are in disrepair and of concern, uh, particularly to uh, the planes that are under there. Uh, we're beginning to see some of the, uh, the roof tiles and things like that fall off. Uh, some of the bolts that were holding on to the, uh, the steel structure have actually uh, rusted off due to the salinity in our air and things of that nature. And so we're doing it, we're, under, we're undergoing an assessment right now uh, and getting ready to put that out for a bit as soon as that assessment is done. Our leasehold facilities, again, we have over, a lot of these buildings are over 40 years of age. And so one of the things that we're doing is to try to go in and um, ensure that it's safe and, uh, and uh, be able to be occupied by any of the tenants in, in those particular areas. Uh, one of the uh, buildings that are included in this is the HC5 hangar that's used by ACI, uh, which is one of our regional jet operators. And so the, uh, the hangar door needs replacement uh, there are some structural issues to the hangar itself as well as uh, painting and things like that. And so the scope of work for that particular project is ready to go. Uh, we're just waiting to have it uh, reviewed by Lego and everybody else before we put it out for a bit. Uh, and then the last two items we have is our airfield support vehicles and equipment. Uh, basically, these are just uh, to upgrade some of our support vehicles for the airfields, uh, things like flatbed trucks, uh, APUs to help us uh, to help uh, maintain power to uh, to our jetways and things like that or to uh, air conditioning units to our jetways uh, just to ensure that they're cool and uh, efficient for our traveling public as they go down um, here in Guam we know that at 2 o'clock in the afternoon as they try to board an aircraft it's like uh, being in a in a hot tin can so and then the last thing we have is we want to improve our arrivals and inspection facilities uh, the scope of work for the automated passport kiosk have, has already been completed. Uh, we're uh, looking into the process of either get, putting it out for bid or looking at putting it out through an RFP. 
Uh, and so what these automated passport kiosks would do is they will actually improve our processing times for our FIS uh, protocols, the Federal Inspection Services protocols, uh, and it should improve our processing times anywhere from 33% uh, to 58%. Um, these, you'll find these kiosks throughout um, the port, major ports of entries in the United States. It's been used in Houston, uh, Chicago, and it was actually developed by uh, Vancouver International Airport uh, for use by all of these different areas. And that concludes the CIP portion. Um, before I turn it back over to the executive manager, is there any questions? You're almost done with the presentation, so why don't you go ahead and uh, finish, and then we'll uh, go ahead and then we'll open for questions. Okay, sir. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Chairman. Before you move to the next slide, if I could also just provide a point of clarification on your packet that was provided, um, where it identifies the airport uh, Guam projects. On the back side of it, it identifies the the first priority and the second priority of our bond of our um, our bond projects that was mentioned earlier. Um, it's not in a specific order with regards to our second priority, but if you can recall when we went to the bond market uh, in 2013 prior to getting legislative approval, uh, we identified the f uh, priority one and priority two projects. So, And the only change to this, sir, is that we took um, the first one listed in the second priority with regards to the seismic upgrade and included that with the third floor corridor. It made sense to just do that at the same time. of concerns that we had and so or that you had had uh, requested for us to talk about us uh, uh, mr. chairman and so the first phase uh, included this portion here of the Tees and Parkway which is phase one and so um, the lands that were acquired either through uh, the airport or through or were owned through DPW or passed through by the, um, the uh, ancestral lands or Guam uh, Land Commission uh, were used for these particular for this particular process you can see here, this is our 12,000 foot runway and the safety zone extends out this way. And, and so that took over uh, the, that took over Central Avenue is actually, I think a little bit further out here, but we had to shut, or it's right here. So we had to shut this down in order to, for us to open this up. And so there's a spot of land back in here that was, acqu was acquired. And that piece of property is actually gonna be used uh, as a ponding basin uh, and to mitigate our storm uh, water uh, runoff, not just for the airport, but as well as for uh, the Tees and Parkway. In phase two, phase two will be constructed from here, this point on, oh, sorry. And, and as, as the M, before I go to the next slide, uh, as the M I mentioned, this 12,000 foot runway gives us the uh, opportunity or the operating capacity to be, to be able to handle Trans-Pacific flight. For, for phase two, it takes up this whole area here. And as you can see, if you go up there, there's still some houses on the left-hand side. And then we still have some remnant parcels on the right-hand side for property that has not been uh, acquired as of yet. Uh, and so we're, we haven't been able to move forward in uh, demolishing uh, those particular properties until that, um, that has been completed. But again, uh, Part of phase, the phase two design will include the stormwater runoff, uh, the ponding basin, uh, to mit, uh, the ponding basin that's going to be located back in this area here, as well as uh, we'll, the airport will be provided navigation easements uh, in perpetuity from uh, the FHWA, um, and then the Teeson Parkway provides a great access corridor from Route Eight, it's from here all the way through, uh, straight through to our terminal. Uh, this parkway actually will go down uh, past. There's a water. Uh, tower in this area here it actually curves down past that water tower and then we have the bypass roads for the airport uh, roadway system um, and it, uh, this will enhance our safety and security of the properties uh, located around the airport uh, and we anticipate that the final land acquisition should take place not later than November of 2016 yes yes ma'am because DPW needs this, these properties in order to proceed with the Garvey bonds that they're uh, trying to um, 
proceed with in, Dece in January 2017. to end it sir uh, if we could with the video outlining the uh, the backbone of the organization our personnel and our stakeholders that make what we believe um, make us the best run agency in the government of Guam thank you Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity again to provide this uh, slide deck to you folks this morning. Great. Uh, first of all, I want to, you know, commend the airport for, uh, I think that was an excellent presentation. And uh, it covered certainly all the uh, points of inquiry that uh, the committee had. Um, but um, I'm sure as we went along, I was taking notes and I do have some questions. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, Refer to uh, Senator Torres if you have any questions that you may want to ask. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had some points of clarification as you're going through. Um, with regard to the non-aeronautical non revenues, specifically what, what constitutes uh, the bulk of the increase in non-aeronautical -aer revenue? The increase, uh, the initial increase that we've seen was from our specialty, specialty retail merchandise concession. Okay, um, yeah. the, the new concession that came in. That's okay. correct. That's correct. Uh, for decades, it was with a single organization. Um, we decided 
I believe it was back in 2013, to leverage that particular concession for a competitive bid, uh, which yielded what it did. Uh, again, it was actually a, a, a key focal point for us in the, our um, investment roadshow uh, that led to the successful uh, uh, bond sale in 2013. Uh, when the market initially opened up, we were over, oversubscribed. I think it was 5.6 billion dollars uh, within um, at the end of the at the end of the um, uh, the market date. It was the first 45 minutes we met our quota, and so again, it, it was our capability to show that you know we can produce or we can bring in non aeronautical revenues. Okay, and they are tracking uh, pretty much as expected in terms of the revenues and they're, the percentage they're, rents. They're now, making they're making their minimum annual, minimum annual guarantee rent. Yes, they are. Okay. I had a question with regard to the noise mitigation um, standards that you had mentioned at the FAA. I know that that was um, the stall happened as far back as three years ago. And uh, I also know that many of the residents in the area were quite disappointed because they were next in queue and then it was halted. Um, and a lot of them didn't understand why. But is, is it a result of the standards being more stringent right now? So is the threshold going to be harder for a lot of those residents to? to realize or, or to qualify for noise mitigation? Yeah, yes, it is. You know, and quite honestly, my, my recent visit um, with the FAA, um, I expressed that concern that we had with regards to the program because of the fact that, and we all know that the um, um, cash shortfall within the federal government, we've seen a lot of changes to the federal programs, uh, whatever line of industry it is, from the airport to EPA to emergency management uh, to the fire and public safety industries. Um, so again, you know, um, they, 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 they changed some of the components in there. Um, and if we can go down the weeds, um, I, I can't do that, but I can certainly turn over to Fred to do that. But with regards to the program itself, it's changed where it, it is difficult to add on, you know, for, for um, uh, new homeowners. I actually even um, expressed to them, again, I was mentioning earlier my disappointment. Um, it's specific to commercial or, or civil uh, airports. You know, we have a military airport on our island as well which is surrounded by a more populated area. And there's, there's, there's no uh, uh, noise mitigation programs offered for those folks in that particular area. Um, and there's different standards. So it's within the federal government. But again, those planes up in, and, and again, that's, a, that's the sound of freedom. Um, but they do not have the same uh, provisions that commercial aircraft do. And um, um, it, it just seems like there's a huge disparity with you know, the civilian population living next to a, a, a defense airport and a civil airport. I think what also needs to occur is because neighbors have seen their neighbors' homes being improved Again, and stuff. Again, yeah, understood. But, but, it's but more, of a, it's more, more of a more of a public outreach, you know, exactly. and education, you know, program. And uh, we, we continue to field calls and, uh, you know, we'll do our best to continue to explain to the residents, you know, uh, that have inquiries or concerns on why they are not, you know, um, involved with the program, how they can how they can, how they think they can get on, you know. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll definitely continue that educational process. Okay. One, one of the questions that I had also was, as we were looking at all the capital improvement projects, and congratulations, by the way, on making progress. Um, many of those projects I, I was familiar with from the time that we were there was all being conceptualized and, and in the work. So it's it's very um, exciting to see that you're actually making proge progress because they were very aggressive and required uh, not only a lot of planning but a lot of, of um, capital so I'm, I'm pleased to see that you're making progress but uh, I, I was just wondering on one of the projects that that we recently implemented the performance management contract with regard to the AC system replacement is that working out uh, well absolutely right yes okay. um, that is and the it is cost neutral it is uh, panning out to be cost neutral yes ma'am it is okay. I, I do want to actually add on uh, well provide clarification on one of the pro uh, projects that Fred mentioned earlier with regards to the light aircraft uh, commuter facility. Um, it is identified on one of our bond projects to develop a international, well, small commuter terminal. Um, the reason why we developed that light, air uh, light aircraft commuter facility was one of two reasons. Uh, safety is paramount at the airport. It, was, it, it made sense for us to um, um, isolate you know, the smaller aircraft operating in and out of the terminal uh, next to larger aircraft. And two, there was a concern with regards to uh, air service development between the Mariana Islands. Um, I, I don't know if you, you folks recalled uh, a while ago that there were some issues with um, uh, Cape Air Services. So that was an increase. But again, the smaller planes, they were smaller than the, the Cape Air units or aircraft. So the light aircraft commuter facility was our response to that. It actually, it, it's, it's a, I believe not only was it good for everyone at the time, but 
it's better for us now from the perspective of it allows us to study it more as when we get into the development of the, the small inner island commuter terminal, we can work out, you know, um, um, a better plan. Is, um, is, the, um, is the skydive operation that presently has a hangar and an office around the, the airport perimeter, is that also factored into the light commuter? Or, or does it factor in at all in terms of the, the usage and the safety? No, and not, not at this point. They still maintain and operate out of there. I know that they do want to build their own hangar facility, and they've approached us you know, on, on, on um, uh, their, their plans to do so. But, but I would think that logically that should fall into the plan of the light aircraft uh, operation there because there, there is there must be at times a conflict in um, in scheduling perhaps and and now that you've got a lot of uh, you've got increased uh, airlines coming in increased numbers it must factor in does it factor in at all yeah. uh, Gerard or no, no? Yes. into the operations or the scheduling good morning uh, I'm Gerard uh, but this the uh, airport terminal manager no the uh, the, the facility is designed for inner island uh, to process through some inspections uh, as minimal as Guam Customs. Uh, the Tandem Skydive's operation has their exclusive security agreement that allows them to operate from where they're at. Okay. And because they're local, there's no clearance uh, criteria that's needed between Customs, Immigrations, or anybody else. Because they just go up and come back down from, uh, from uh, that activity. So that, that's why the difference is from that standpoint. And it's actually advantageous for them to operate on that side because the, to travel across to load up and then bring back the aircrafts across the runway, it's about, it's a fuel burn issue uh, for the aircrafts and startup. So uh, in that area. The, the uh, only other question that I had, um, with, I, and I was, I was happy, that, happy to learn that you're working on the the fire suppressant system, because I know that that was an issue for many years, and uh, you're on fire watch at one point, and that sort of thing to be in compliance. But I, I would presume then that the water system uh, that came online a couple years ago was is fully functional, and that has also contributed to the to the uh, success of getting the water suppressant system up to up to par. Is that uh, right yes, ma'am. Uh, we've been in an operating agreement with uh, GWA for the past four years. Uh, we're uh, we're in negotiations again, or at, at least we're, we've begun our discussions with them uh, now that uh, their new uh, general manager has come on board. Uh, and so we're hoping that this one stays a, a little bit longer so that we can actually resolve, uh, you know, uh, or actually execute a new operating agreement with them so that they can, uh, so that we can maintain our compliance with the FAA regulations and uh, things of that nature. So it's it's been on a, a, a an annual renewal or yes, ma'am. It's yeah. been on an annual renewal. Okay. Well, good luck with that. I, mean, <laughs> I know it. I know it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a task. It's a big task to yes, to settle. But I um, know that's good. Uh, and then one last question. You mentioned the ILS system and the new the new runway, the extended runway six left. Is it presently being used only for takeoff, not for landing, or is it being used for landing as well? No, it, it's being used for both, but for both. we just haven't commissioned uh, the second run, uh, the second ILS yet. So okay. they can still use uh, the VFR rules to land on that uh, particular runway. Okay, so yeah. they are. All right. Yes, ma'am. Right. It's Thank a dual you. operation. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I want to focus in on the um, access into and out of the airport. So um, now that you've closed off Central Avenue, um, DPW was able to, I guess, acquire land from the airport uh, to be able to build that new, the replacement of Central Avenue from um, on the southwest end coming from Cars Plus, correct? Uh, and then you, you mentioned in your briefing that phase two would go down um, Sunset Boulevard and then eventually come down by where the water tank is at to hook in to Route 10. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's a great you know, setup because there's alternate uh, um, ways to get in and out of the airport. Um, so if there, was a, if there was a tie up on Route 1 or on Route 10, uh, you can always come in through Route 8. That's great. Um, now, you indicated that the acquisition of all the private properties 
along the way should be finished around November of 2016. Now is that on the airport's dime um, to, to uh, acquire all those properties? Uh, no, sir, it's not. Uh, the briefing that we provide you with regards to the teens in acquisition and the properties, it's uh, what we know of the project. Um, it's a DPW um, uh, project, um, but also, but we provide input uh, input to it. Uh, but as far as the acquisition of the parcels of property, that, that is on DPW and uh, other agencies of the government of Guam. Okay, so so what did the uh, what did the airport? How did it utilize? Because I believe it, I believe uh, Federal Highways paid the airport about five million dollars to acquire a portion of that property on the south west corner. Correct. There was properties from airport, our land inventory that was required for phase one of the Tizen Parkway. Right. Um, we use uh, some of that monies for uh, acquisition of remnant properties. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're involved from the perspective of uh, the development of phase two, as if there's, again, uh, on, during the land acquisition, if there's remnant properties, the airport would like to acquire those properties as well. Uh, we feel that it'll be more of an economic value to us as opposed to uh, any other individuals that those slivers of property are, are quite small and um, it's closer to our fence line. Um, um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're looking and um, um, we're monitoring and looking to the possibilities of acquiring any remnant property on phase two. Okay, so, so I just want to make it clear in my mind then. So then the properties that the airport is looking to acquire, uh, if it hasn't already done so, are the private properties on uh, between your fence line and the existing um, um, uh, Sunset Boulevard, the existing road right now that's going into the airport? Correct. That's okay. correct. On, on, so that would be on the south side of that south main road, road that exists right yes, now, sir. right? That's right. Now, the properties, the private properties that are to be acquired on the north side of that existing road, is that going to remain Gov Guam properties? Uh, sir, I'm, I'm not, sure. I'm not um, sure. Again, we're, we're focused on our side of the road. Okay. Um, I, I know that with, with the layout um, we talked about earlier, our land inventory with our, our business development area, uh, we would like to keep that, that okay. well, if we acquire, you know, the existing road, use that as a service road for our properties. Yeah. Okay. So then now the property to be acquired down by where the water tank is at, is that going to be a DPW uh, That's correct. endeavor? Yes. Okay, fine. That's correct. So we've talked about accessing the airport on the north side, coming in from the southwest from Route 8 uh, and coming in on the north side from uh, Route 10, Route 1, Route 10. How does the airport what plans does the airport have to access the properties that you have? I presume you still have properties along the south side of the runway, correct? Yes. That's correct. So how is the airport, what, what plans does the airport have for access into there? The existing runways that, that are available today, sir. The existing roads, you mean? Correct. Okay, so the there's no plans to, to make any improvements. Now, is the airport aware about Mariner Avenue Yes. And that there was actually plans already staked out. Yes. And 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 so is the airport looking at developing that access? Yeah, check on sir. Uh, yes, sir. We're we're aware of Mariner Avenue. That was one of the original plans back in 1995 uh, through the BRAC process. Uh, and so, um, but unfortunately, Mariner Avenue, the properties, um, the properties on the. Uh, on the southbound side of Mariner Avenue, that's the airport boundary. There are only four units on the, um, I would say, the south side where uh, Customs and is located, those four buildings. Uh, those are the only four buildings on that side of the property that belong to the airport. Everything else on, on uh, the north side of Mariner Avenue is airport property. And so Mariner Avenue, the construction of that would actually be, be a DPW project, uh, again, in coordination with uh, with the airport. Just like the Tijin, the phase two parkway uh, process, uh, the airport is involved only because there's a ponding basin uh, that and uh, uh, there's a ponding basin that is going to be required uh, for stormwater mitigation uh, for the DPW for the for the Tizen Parkway as well as for the airport runoff. Okay. 
But, but the funding of the develop the further development of Mariner Avenue is not something that deep, that the airport would be uh, looking at pitching in some some funds. If if it's if it's within our grant uh, covenants and or if it's if we're eligible for that particular process. So if FHWA comes out and says we want to give you uh, money to construct and access roadway system into those properties, then we would be we would participate in that process. Okay. Um, now going back to your um, to the capital improvement projects that you have, I think the the bonds that you floated in 2013 was about to the tune of a hundred and how much? Two hundred and forty-seven. Yeah. Two hundred and forty-seven million dollars. Yes, sir. Um, now, I noticed that there was uh, a number of projects uh, that are currently in progress uh, that are also federally funded, such as the holding bag area, the holding bag relocation projects, the uh, the ARF, the um, about. So I guess that's a dual fund. Those are dual funded projects. Some from the bond correct. that you floated, and some from the federal. That's correct, sir. There, it's a combination of both funding sources. I care to guess what's what? What's the uh, ratio? Is it like thirty percent? It, it, uh, it, it varies. Uh, like the baggage relocation, it's five percent, um, and actually five percent federal. Uh, five percent was Airport. our lo was the local yeah. local share. Okay. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, um, I. I and I'll do it again. I have to. Um, our airport terminal manager, Mr. Gerard Bautista, actually took the lead on that. Um, it was actually identified as a, a project that was going to be uh, picked up by our bond entirely. Um, but again, Mr. Bautista uh, went after a competitive grant and got the lion's share um, of that grant. So we were able to enjoy, you know, again, a 5% contribution to that project, which is uh, estimated about $26 million. Correct. Yeah. Oh, well, good for you. Did he get a cut from that? Or? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> he got recognition in our, our <laughs> weekly, uh, he got, he got our, our quarterly yeah. employee-wide meeting. Manager of the year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. That, that, that's, uh, that's certainly something to applaud, uh, that, you know, that you, you looked for that and you were able to get it. And so that's, that's good to hear. Now, has, um, has, in your meetings with DPW, have they indicated what kind of an estimated start time they're looking at for the expansion of the Route 10? No, sir. I, I, that, that would have to uh, come after. You're talking from Route 10, 1, from all the route way up to one. 16? Correct. Yeah, yeah. That, that would have to come after the Teeson Parkway. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, it, but again, uh, in our planning efforts, we identified with regards to our projects, um, again, the, the, the loss uh, spaces that we have in our public and commercial parking lots. Um, that's why we identified the expansion of our um, uh, our public parking area for okay. an upper deck. All right. Yeah. Yes. When you talk about acquisition of Tizen properties for uh, along the Tizen Cliff Line, uh, any remnant properties, what valuation is the airport relying on for the for those properties? And I know I know that at one point there was. Uh, at one point, there was a, an appraisal done early on before when we were contemplating the alternative routes and we arrived at Route 4A, which is the first, the first uh, part that we constructed. Um, are you relying on those valuations from that, that period, or are, have you since uh, commissioned a new appraisal? Correct. Uh, we're required to uh, conduct appraisals um, on, a th I believe it's three year, every three years, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, um, if I misspeak today, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to contact your office to provide you the quick, uh, correct data. But yes, it's on um, on those um, uh, data that you know uh, uh, we determine you know, in the value from that. Because but I also think, in addition to the safety perspective as well, you know that's. that's but if we're I, and I asked that because if, if we're looking at the, the, the chairman asked about uh, whose responsibility is it to acquire that and and. Your response was that it's a DPW project, so that'll give us a sense of how realistic or how timely this project is going to be completed. If if the valuation suggests yeah, if, uh, a price tag associated with the land acquisition, so I think that that's understood. important to yeah. provide to the committee. Sir. If in fact you've updated it, it would. Can I answer? 
ma'am, uh, so we've been in discussions with DPW, and basically uh, the lots that, that have been identified, there's already been a value assigned to these lots. And so they're hoping to close the deals by November of this this year, uh, so that they so that DPW can proceed with their projects beginning in January of next year. And the valuation was done by DPW or by Federal Highways? Or it was done. It was done through uh, an appraisal process. I don't know which which is the latest one. I would have to look at that uh, to uh, verify that. But we actually have the the lands are already uh, the the prices or the value of the la of those properties are in the gut in discussions right now with uh, some of the attorneys that, that might be useful for the chairman to to review yes sir thank you okay now um, going back to the bond projects that are in progress you you had named off the R facility the uh, the loading bridge uh, the um, the relocation of the holding bag area What's the estimated time of completion for those projects? Can, can, can you repeat this again, the baggage line? There was the baggage, uh, the holding bag, uh, relocation, the loading bridge um, replacement. I think you said that one was yes, finished. Sir. And then you've got the, uh, the ARF uh, yes, facility. Okay. 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 Yes, sir. Um, okay, so the hold, hold, uh, the hold bag screening relocation, we're at 50 percent uh, in that project right now. Uh, we anticipate that project to come online in, uh, by no, not later than April of 2017. Uh, with regards to the integrated passenger loading bridge, uh, we replaced uh, the one uh, gate 21, who, which bridge was uh, the most dilapidated of all. Uh, the other 16 bridges are still in uh, in use and it's still uh, in repair, and so we've been refurbishing those as well. But as uh, but we're continuing to assess them, uh, and we have an assessment program uh, to ensure that uh, as we need to replace them, they'll come down. Uh, these bridges are quite expensive; they're about eight hundred thousand dollars a piece. And so it, it's really, um, we're trying to manage that process while ensuring uh, that we still have the funding available uh, uh, through uh, the fiscal years as we go through. Uh, with regards to the R facility, we're in the process of preparing the scope of work to go out for RFP for the actual design of uh, that facility. Uh, that RFP should be completed within the next month or two. It's been uh, pushed to the front uh, of FAA's list, and so we should have that to them. Uh, you should see the RFP out within the next uh, 90 days, I would say. Uh, and then once that's completed, um, the designers will have about six, uh, about eight months to complete their design, and then we can go out for bid for construction. So hopefully by the beginning of next year, ma'am, or Mr. Chairman, uh, 2017, we'll start to demolish and uh, begin the construction of the new facility. Um, on the International Arrivals Corridor, I, I know you mentioned that that's currently in the procurement process, but um, so, so what's in the procurement, what's in the solicitation stage right now, the A&E or the construction? The actual construction. Construction. For, yes, for that particular project. And so what is the late, what is the most current um, uh, closing date for the submittal of uh, proposals? It, it actually, it, it has passed, it's came and passed, and we're actually in the evaluation process. Oh, you're in the evaluation that's, process? That's correct. Okay, yes, and that, and it's finished when it's finished? That's correct, sir. Okay. Yeah. February 4th was when the bids were open, sir. When the bids were, oh, when the bids were received? Were, yes, sir. Were received, yeah. okay, yes, sir. And, and, all right, yeah. fine, great. Um, and, well, and I guess, I guess so far, uh, I mean, I haven't heard of any protests or anything. I mean, protests could happen. <laughs> uh, could have, if there was going to be any serious protests, it would have happened uh, by now already until, of course, the next one when you decide who you're going to award it to, then that's when, you know, the other round of protests would come out. But so far, there's, there hasn't been any glitches, has there? No, sir. And, you know, um, it's unfortunate, you know, there's several of Guam procurement process is notorious, well, I don't say process, but the process itself is notorious for protests. We're crossing our fingers that we're finally past those stages. Yeah. That's correct. And, and, I've, and I've found, I guess, with the involvement that I've had with procurement, that really the, the procurement laws are, they, they need some updating and it needs some tightening, um, but really when we run into a lot of 
protest problems and all that, usually it's down at the procuring agency uh, level because we forgot to do dot the I or cross the T, and that's what gets us in trouble. And it's not so much the procurement law itself. So this speaks well of your procurement division. Yes. What we have, though, sir, in the past, um, I can give you an example. Uh, a year ago, we did a small fencing project. Um, I, th I believe there was about 27 submissions, and there was a protest filed by someone that came in, I think, like at 23, and um, held up that process. So, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not a perfect system, but, you know, um, if there's something in there that we can possibly look at for, I guess, any liquidated damages for any frivolous, you know, um, you know, yeah. protests, you know, that that would be something to look at. Unfortunately, that, that did go without incident, went through the process. Uh, there was found, it wasn't not a valid protest at all, but all it did was just hold up, you know, that particular fence line project. Right. And um, as a matter of fact, it, was, um, it wasn't it was the same inquiry that your office had with regards to one of our exterior, our perimeter fences, but it was similar to that. It was just uh, a repair work on, on, on damaged portion of our fence line. And uh, instead of getting it up quicker, you know, than we would have liked it, because of that protest period, it, it went further down the road. Okay. Tell me something about this OCIP insurance. Is that like a self-insurance program? Uh, it's similar to a self-insurance program, but basically what it is, um, Mr. Chairman, is it's a wrap-up insurance uh, that's required uh, by the, con the general contractors, uh, and it's on a case-by-case -case basis. And so what the OCIP does is it allows um, the owner, which would be the airport, to uh, be able to maintain uh, the, pre the, the premiums, uh, uh, handle the administrative and legal costs a lot better uh, than if we were to just leave it in, in the GC's hands uh, because they'll, all they'll do is they'll, they have all these different uh, areas that would need to be insured and then they just tack on um, those costs into the bids and that drives the bids up quite, uh, quite consi uh, high. So those are some of the so the OCIP is an alternative to um, mitigating that and being able to control those costs associated with the insurance. Is, is this a new program that you It's made? It's not, uh, Mr. Chairman. What it is is it's just been um, revamped. It, so it was a wrap-up insurance requirement that's required by the GCs to have. Uh, the GCs, the general The general contractors, yes. Sir. And so the OCIP is just the owner's controlled insurance program. That's all it is. And so it allows us to be able to monitor and maintain adequate insurance to ensure that um, should any uh, type of liability or injuries occur uh, on site. For, and it's on a case-by-case -case, uh, um, project. So the OCIP can only be uh, administered to one project at a time. And that's, and that's, what, that's how uh, the OCIP works. Okay. Um, in, in your slides, you showed uh, a number of projects that were pending, uh, and I guess pending the availability of uh, uh, funding from the discretionary funds. So, you know, just like, for example, uh, for the compact impact, Guam, uh, well, um, um, the U.S. Congress uh, uh, appropriates, I don't know, let's say $30 million dollars uh, to fund for compact impact, and out of that, Guam gets maybe, I don't know, 50% of it, whatever the percentage is. Uh, with respect to the FAA, and I guess that's where the discretionary funds are you looking at, right? How much is, the, how big is the pot that gets distributed to the various islands, and what's Guam's share of that normally? There, there's variable, um there's different variables on how much is appropriated um, with regards to the FAA funding, uh, the size of the airport, uh, your standings with the programs, and things of that nature. We've actually been um, consistent with our entitlements uh, or discretionary funding over the past several years. About so, how much? Yeah. So basically what it is is uh, we have two types of uh, funding from the FAA. One, the entitlement funding is something that we receive every year based on the size of our airport. We're considered a small hub airport. And so we generate about $4.5 million in entitlement funding a year. Uh, discretionary funding is based on what the uh, U.S. Congress passes as their budget law. Uh, and they'll tell the FAA, okay, you have, uh, you know, X amount of dollars uh, to use in your programs. That's your discretionary funding. Use it as you please. Uh, the FAA will send us a message saying, hey, we have this money for the uh, safety management uh, systems as well as the wildlife mitigation programs. Uh, we want you guys to apply for it. And so uh, what we work, the way we work is we uh, work with the FAA closely. 
uh, to coordinate uh, those grant requests on a year on an annual basis. And so for this year, for FY 2016, we're anticipating receiving over uh, two and a half million dollars from them in discretionary funding, in addition to our entitlement funding of 4.5 million. Is, is two and a half million about what you've been getting annually? It can fluctuate, Senator, uh, Mr. Chairman, because it just all depends on which project we're going to be using that discretionary funding for. All right. So, like last year, we had 11 million. Uh, this year, we're going to get two million. So it just all it makes a difference. Yeah. And, it, and it's true, also, Mr. Tupas, that a lot of of uh, your success depends on whether you have projects ready. Yes. Uh, package ready, and 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 I think that's part of what. Uh, to the airport's credit, has been your success in getting a lot of those discretionary monies as you have projects that are well articulated, well packaged, and almost shovel ready. Yes, ma'am. And, and so so one example that we have right now is that the funding for the uh, cargo apron, re, uh, uh, cargo apron uh, construction for the integrated air cargo facility, that funding is going to be provided to us for the design uh, by the FAA in uh, fiscal year 2017. But what they've asked us, because we already have the scope of work ready to go, is if they have additional funding towards the end of their funding season, which will be in June, then they'll ask us if we can send in that grant request and they'll fund it from that grant request. So if we don't fund it this year uh, through discretionary funding, they already have that project program for us for next year's discretionary funding. I, I, I'd like to also um, uh, share with you, and I know you had the opportunity, both you senators actually had the opportunity to meet with the associate you know, administrator for airports, Mr. De Angelis. Um, that was actually a direct result of our success with regards to having the shuttle, uh, shuttle ready projects and being in line for all the federal programs. Uh, prior to Mr. Angelis's visit to Guam, who by the way is a presidential uh, appointee uh, to the FAA, uh, we had eyebrows raised in DC. Uh, Christine Ferranato, who's associate, um, um, associate administrator for airports, was inquiring on why is Guam getting the lion's share in the Western Pacific with regards. And, and Senator, I know you had direct involvement with that as well during your time at the airport. So. Um, again, it, it's just showcases the good work that we have at the airport with regards to being on top of uh, our gate. But it, we have seen the slight decline on some of that funds. And um, I know if it's, you know, because again, the folks that distribute that funds, you know, have their eyes open and they're actually talking and working with other jurisdictions to, you know, uh, to receive some of that. So, you know, we'll keep pushing hard. And, um, you know, again, appreciate the support that you guys have in the circles that you work with, you know, and, and making sure that you know um, uh, we get more than our fair share. Uh, I just got two f two final questions, and this is more close to the ground and into the weeds sort of thing. But you you spoke about upgrades to the public restroom, changing out some pipes and and some of the I guess the, the urinals or whatever. But let's face it, I don't care how how much you modernize that thing, you're always going to get that guy who misses the urinal. <laughs> And so the question is, is do you have enough maintenance going in there, maintenance personnel going in there to, you know, to, to uh, frequently wipe up the, the floors? We, we, we like to think we do. Um, and the reason why I say that is that it is written in our contracts. Uh, we do actually have a QC um, a component within our system, within our, our property and facilities. Um, but again, we do find a lot of gaps. Um, unfortunately, you know, not, you know, um, Again, there are challenges with regards to procurement. Um, we're looking to write better, um, I guess, RFPs for it. Uh, one of the challenges that we had in the past was, again, with FOIAs. Every time it goes out to bid, every t every single time we get FOIAed and we see that number come down lower and lower and lower every year. After, and um, you know, we've actually changed out vendors. Um, we're wanting to write it more on performance as opposed to price. Um, we actually had. I believe it was over a million or close to a million dollar contracts where there was no issues. Uh, we have contracts where now it's down to what two hundred some thousand dollars, and you know it's on Facebook. You know some of the challenges that we have. Um, so again, you know, um, um, it, it's it's something that we take extremely seriously, and um, again, like I mentioned earlier, we've developed a QC program within our organization to try and manage that. Um, but again, we're we're in the process of really tightening up. You know the verbiage. You know for the next go around, uh, where again we, we're going to try not to focus on price, but on on, on service. And uh, finally, my my final question is the 
what what is the airport's plans right now regarding the ground transportation taxi cab services um, you, you've tried to put it out for a concession bid um, there was enough I guess rankling about it that you, you know um, you guys decided to pull it back so so where are you gonna go next with this Sir, I don't, I don't think it was more so the rankings that going on with it. I think it was uh, our thought process and putting it out. I think we should have done a better job um, because, yes, there was concerns. But, again, at the end of the day, what we want to do is and, and, and fall in line with, you know, the, the, the vision that's, you know, out there with raising our visitor industry from not just a, you know, a, a, a value destination but a quality destination. You know, uh, the airport's the first impression. And, um, you know, I can't thank the staff and the partners enough, you know, for, for our efforts to ensuring that we, we meet that impression. When it comes to our ground transportation services, you know, that was, you know, and, and there are other gaps. But with regards to that, when we saw, you know, five different vendors or four different vendors operating in five different styles, but, you know, in line with the, with the uh, policy that we had, it became problematic because it's a very competitive market um, um, with, the current, with the current setup. Um, so again, we wanted to alleviate some of that, you know, uh, well, not alleviate some of that, alleviate that in its entirety. Um, again, you know, some of the challenges that we had in our, our customs hall with regards to wait times, it, it, you know, it's not a good impression for, for someone coming into Guam for the first time, waiting more than an hour, and then seeing, you know, some disruption with regards to, or inconsistencies with regards to our ground transportation. Um, so we are gonna look at it, you know, I, I wanna applaud our board uh, we have a working. We have working groups within our board. Um, our ground transportation policy does need revamping. You know, especially with some of the the newer modes of transportation uh, to include Uber. Um, we, we know and we've seen uh, there there is you know some some form to that um, um, here on island that's not registered with the airport and uh, it's it's not regulated that you know that we need to get our arms around. Uh, we have identified and, and we, we deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis as, as, as it's encountered. But again, it's something that we really need to put down in black and white, identify on how are we going to uh, uh, integrate these types of services uh, or are we going to prohibit them? You know, um, um, when I say prohibit, meaning, you know, these Uber type services. Um, but again, with regards to the ground transportation system, uh, we do want to fall in line with other, you know, uh, airport jurisdictions where, where it's regulated. Um, um, and. Uh, and just like anything we do at the airport, you know, Fred mentioned earlier, we're regulated by everything in the alphabet soup. We got four of them living in our house every day. Um, but again, uh, we want to make sure it's regulated and the customer service is on is on point with the overall objective of raising the um, 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 the, the customer experience, you know, for, for our arriving visitors. Okay. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, did you, uh, Gerber, did you have any? Uh comments and remarks you'd like to make for yes, Mr. Chairman, I, um, first of all, my panel did such a great job, I, I did not have to uh, participate that much. I thank them very much. Uh, in your regards to the taxis, the last, we, we work with committees in, in that regard, and we're trying to raise the standard to, to try and, and give the, the customer a better experience. Um, the fares, as in other jurisdictions, I believe I've seen where uh, they are displayed on the on the windows, where everyone that that travels would would have an idea of what what region they're going to, what zone, and and know exactly what they're going to pay. So that sort of prevents any any um, out of the norm uh, practices that may occur. So we we've, we've looked at this uh, a number of times, and I, and I hope that we come to uh, uh, to complete this project so we can. And better the service. Um, other than that, Mr. Chairman, I think. Okay. Oh, the bathrooms. I'm approached about the bathrooms, uh, you know, monthly, weekly, and I think we've we've improved a lot. We did uh, improve a couple, and um, I am one to to uh, to notice these things. I go in, I, I check, and it seems to have improved. We we have some issues, but I think uh, it's improved much more than what we had in the past. Uh, there there was a a problem with um, the smell, 
and we all felt it was because of lack of attention from the uh, maintenance. But it turned out that our our pipes in in the in the bathrooms were old, and it it prevented uh, flushing, I believe, right? So therefore, we, we constantly battled the stench, and, and finally we found out what it was. And I think we've addressed that, so it's improving. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so, Mr. Chairman, we thank you for, for uh, this opportunity. This is the first informational hearing I've been to, and uh, uh, a lot of technical information, and I, I think it benefits both sides. And we thank you for your support from this, your committee, and we hope to work with you more. And on, uh, I know we've been working with the leases, to try and streamline uh, the procedures so that we could develop the, the airport even more. And, and, and I, uh, you know, it's kind of ironic. You can put in hundreds of millions of dollars of improvements, and it's that, you know, it's that uh, $100 uh, fix, yes. like the stench in the bathroom that would just kind of like, you know, set you back to uh, the starting point. So, but uh, really, and, and Senator, unless you have any, uh, okay. As I was thinking about the, um, all the improvements within the terminal that are occurring right now, as you're looking at your third floor corridor, you're going, it's going to open up the opportunity for retail space now in those areas that, that were vacated when the, when the divider came into place. Would, could that then be um, something that, that would, that would uh, compel you to reconsider that uh, space that has been, that retail space that was put in opposite the, the bathrooms right by the food court? Because I, I noticed with the expansion of the, of the, the retail space or the, the renovation of the new retail space, you've got that going on and then you've got the, the food court going on and some of the retail space spills into the, the, the corridor. With that retail area that's confined and I believe there's a bookstore in there right now. Okay. It it creates a a, a a nonsensical jam right there, traffic jam, because it's it's central and everybody's going through, and then you've got this right smack and dab in the middle. And perhaps it was planned at a different time when traffic wasn't quite the way Correct. it was, and the layout wasn't that way for the retail. But I I think that I would recommend, as a consumer, um, that, that that be rethought because that space is just, it, it's like putting a, a boulder in the middle of a stream. That, that, that's correct. And then we, we, we really look forward to, again, the opportunity to, to move those dividers. And because uh, again, it's not only the revenue, the revenue um, uh, increase that we're going to see, but the operational efficiency, um, you know, uh, that we're going to be able to maximize gate usage and um, this is going to be a, a cleaner flow. But not only the, the divider, I'm talking about right now you've got an, a, a situation where you've got people that are packed waiting to board when, when there's those, those high traffic times, in the early in the morning particularly. It is, it is a mess there, and it's miserable because you've got people packed in that one area. You've got a shop right smack in the middle, people lined up to go to the restroom, people coming out of the food court. It, it's crazy. And um, I think, if anything, that would be one good that would alleviate a lot of that and, and allow the air to flow a little bit and the people to traffic. So if there's a way to tinker at that and kind yeah. of move that out of the footprint while you're, you're building, that would create a lot of space and comfort right now. Got it. We'll explore that. that thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about exploring it now. I'm actually, you got my mind thinking of, uh, and I actually I'm, I'm got talking a, about right now. I'm exactly. talking about right now they need, they need exactly. to open up a window because it's... Understood. I cry got my, when I get stuck in that lounge area. I don't cry, but I feel like crying. <laughs> but I'm sure the others feel like crying too. Maybe some of them do. But uh, no, thank you. Just an observation. Uh, just, just one final question, and that is, uh, you mentioned that you know you're going to need to do something about your parking uh, facilities, uh, especially when the Route 10 expansion. Has there been any thought given to a uh, uh, public-private partnership? Uh, uh, arrangement to construct that, construct and operate uh, the parking facility. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, that's actually something that we're, we we would mind exploring. Um, there was some conversation just tossed out very lightly um, uh, with some individuals because, again, with our our rental car uh, companies, you know, um, uh, that's actually coming up um, for bid as well. So the discussion has been talked about, you know, as we share our plans, you know, uh, with our stakeholders. So we've thrown that out there. You know, um, it's always good to, you know, um, um, 
share the risk and reduce our uh, investment, our monies into projects. Um, um, but again, strengthen partnerships that we have with the existing stakeholders. So, yeah, it's it's out there. There's 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 again. Um, and of course, that would have to be a long-term sort of arrangement, which would then require some legislative intervention to allow the airport to enter into a that, that's correct, know, sir. Long-term agreement. That's correct. So, well, with that, I, I just want to, again, say thank you very much um, for the presentation. Looks like you've put in uh, uh, a fair amount of time to uh, prepare this. The presentation was, was, was real good. Um, and the questions that the committee had, had asked to be answered, I think, were uh, adequately answered. So I want to thank you for that. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead then, and this committee will go into recess and we come back in the afternoon at 2 for a public hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. All right.